In this video, we're going to cover just the very basics of log4j. And from a bird's eye view, there are essentially three things that happen when you are setting up the system, when you are implementing log4j. First is, you need to initialize it. And then secondly, you need to configure it. So then lastly, we have your actual log statements. So these are the three major components. And ultimately, what log4j is trying to do is answer uh, this question of how do I provide, how do I do some sort of logging? So imagine this is your code, and then you've got some log statement kind of sandwiched in here. How do, how do you set this up so that when you're writing your code here, and then you want lots of detail, right? Potentially you want debug level uh, in, uh, log statements in a lot of cases, but that's while you're developing it. When you go into production, though, you don't want your users to be able to see all this level of detail, so you want, and yet you don't want to go back through and change, you know, tons and tons of code, all these logging lines. And you can change the level, so f debug, can you can say, I don't want debug to show up when I'm in this environment. And this is just one of the sort of nice things that log4j lets you do. But ultimately, you have these three components. Now when the system is initializing, it will also configure, in most cases, not necessarily, you can do this separately, but very often the initialization itself will start up or will look for configuration data. So this is kind of, they go sort of part and parcel. And then thirdly, of course, you're going to issue those log statements. So when you get started with log4j, one of the most important things you can do is go to the website here, the Apache log4j2 website. And the reason is because if you scroll down here to documentation, you'll find a PDF file here. And once you download it, you can get a ton of information. It's 251 pages uh, to this document, which we're going to sort of summarize here. And again, what we, what we just looked at was this architectural diagram of how all of the major classes, what they are and how they interact, and it even comes with, thankfully, a kind of nice description of what each, what each of those classes mean and what they're doing. And for a really good uh, kind of introduction uh, from a practical sense in how Log4j works, definitely check out this YouTube video here. And we're going to use uh, at least one snapshot from that video. Now, ultimately, what's happening is you have these things called loggers and a thing called an appender. And a an appender is really the thing that is most practical for us because it's the thing that will actually write your log to a file, but it doesn't have to be a file, actually. It could be plenty of other um, sort of targets or outputs. And that's described here on page 8 here. You can see in log4j speak an output destination is called an appender. Currently appenders exist for console, for files, for remote socket servers, Apache Flume, JMS, and so on. And so we're going to look uh, a little bit more at the architecture uh, now, but just keep in mind page 3 has a lot of really kind of overall view of the system. Now before we go into the actual architecture uh, in a bit more detail what appenders are in that, uh, it's important to look at page 19 here that says uh, inserting log requests into the application code requires a fair amount of planning and effort. Observation shows that about 4% of code is dedicated to logging. So you don't, <laughs> it says consequently even moderately sized applications will have thousands of logging statements embedded within their code and I'll let you read the rest of this, but you get the idea. What we had seen earlier with single lines of, of logging information, it may not be the best way to, uh, as they say, get the information, your log information out to a user, but sometimes it's the only way to do it. And you can see that described here on page one. Inserting log statements into code is a low-tech method, but it may be the only way, especially because once you're in, a, in an environment, a production environment, you still need to get information about what went wrong, and you don't obviously have a debugger in a production environment. So if you go to page 16 of the manual, you'll see a Hello World implementation. And if you look at what it is exactly that's happening here, you'll see that there is something called a logger or log manager and really the log manager in our hierarchy here sort of sits 
uh, roughly here. It's kind of outside of this architecture, but it's, it's sort of running the, the system. And then you're also going to do this import for logger. And by the way, you don't need to be um, a programmer to understand this part or to use this part. Well, to use it maybe, but not to understand it. This is simply a kind of so you're aware how the whole system works. You're going to create this logger. And to create the logger, uh, you do that through this method here called get logger, and that happens through, of course, this log manager that we've been looking at. In fact, when, it's when you issue this get logger that you are going to get this, as it says here, the logger. And eventually, well, essentially the logger is going to read a logger config, which itself comes from this configuration. And remember that that configuration came from this right here when we did our initial configuration, which itself came from the initialization of the system. When all of that has happened, then you can get to these appenders down here. Now these filters that you see here are what are allowed or basically what is allowed and what is not allowed to flow to the appenders. And you can see that explained uh, right here. And then to determine what it is that gets passed to the appenders and what does not is all based on the things called something called a log level. Those levels are trace, debug, info, warn, error, and fatal. And you can see them, in fact, in the hello world code. In fact, if you look right here, you'll see it listed here. So in other words, once you have created your logger and then you start using your log statement, because obviously that's the log statement there, you're, you're asking to, to do some logging. Here is where you mention the level itself. And if you move to pay, or switch to page 20, you'll see this more worked example, which is also uh, really useful to kind of implement this hello world, which we had sort of seen the way they uh, set up the get logger. Uh, previously in the hello world, you can see how this kind of flows through. And what I mean by that is, of course, you've got your logger statement, you've got your log manager, exactly like before, and then you're creating your logger with the get logger, just like before, and you can see that we're doing a trace this time, not just an info, but a trace, and here's an error, and we are essentially creating this application that will, in the end, give output like this, and you'll see error listed, because that's the level, and then the output that was, um, that was put in the statement previously. And if you watch the video that I suggested from before, you'll see that there is a .properties file that's used for the configuration of uh, log4j. And you will notice too that you have these debug, standard out, and file. Is If you are about to deploy your application, what you can do is say remove debug. And then whatever is logged to your log file or wherever you're logging, anything that said debug in your statements will not be written to the file.